troublemaker. Excellent. Thank you. Woo! Yes, there and then there. Yes, please. Well, that's a that's a. All right, in a way, I'm gonna give you a completely useless answer and then I'll give you a hopefully more useful quant. So of course it's not gonna be a thing. Like how do I go, how do I start doing philosophy? Well, raise your right arm, you know, I mean, that's not, there's not gonna be a thing you can do. Because philosophy is different for all of us, right? We all have to start from who we are and where we are. Philosophy, again, I think it's immensely, it's essentially personal, right? So what it's gonna mean for you, I can't say. But I do think, one way to think of you know, a way of life is to say, I'm gonna make sure, in the same way he was just referring to, that in my everyday life, I remember to say, why? Why? Why do I think that? Why does he think that? Why does she think that? Are there good reasons, right? And that will take, sometimes that'll happen in your bed, sitting there staring at the ceiling in the morning when you wake up. Sometimes it's going to happen in the metro. Sometimes it's going to happen in a classroom, reading a book, cooking. I don't know. But it, it's like, a, it's almost, it's a discipline. That's why I say it's a way of life. It's bringing together this history and this set of problems and this set of tools and then making yourself live it. And that's, I don't know the answer, what it's gonna be for you. But I'd bet you if you said, okay, I'm gonna try and figure this out. I'm gonna make sure I read, I spend some time, I'm gonna ask questions. If I get told this, I don't have to be rude, and maybe I don't even say anything, but I think about, wait, what are the reasons? Why would someone think that? And I think if you do that, you'll find, I hope, a, a, a beginning of an answer. And maybe that means going to class, maybe it has nothing to do with class. Maybe for you, philosophy is gonna be closer to art. You know, maybe it's gonna be closer to yoga, right? I mean, I don't know the answer for you what it will mean to engage in that discipline. But, yeah, you start, you have to start. Hmm. Is, it, is it more of like a search, a search for meaning? Is it, is it learning to ask the right questions? It's, I don't know if there are right questions. It's learning, it's committing yourself to asking, to keep asking, to keep striving, to be comfortable with the fact that you're not sure to embrace the things that you're not sure about, right? The philosopher lives a very uncomfortable life. Back to the question of philosophers going crazy, right? You have to be willing to say, okay, I don't know, I'm not sure. And right when you find that, right when you're looking in the mirror and it gets uncomfortable, that's when you start. And so commit yourself to that. That would be one way to think of how, and you do it for yourself, you know, no one else can. Um, someone else, I missed. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, you have been paid. You need to, you're trying to get me to stop? No. Oh. Oh, I thought, okay. Yes. Uh, what are doing? Why do they make him uh, a god as, as they make Jesus? Wow. Well, you mean, I presume you mean Socrates, not Descartes, who was after, yeah, okay. Um, I have no idea. I could, I could guess. I could tell you stories, but I, I don't know why. I mean, I don't know why they made Jesus a prophet, right? A god, not a prophet. Well, again, depending on who's, who, who you talk to, he may or may not be a god, right? And we're back to the interesting philosophical problem of how do we adjudicate faith and reason giving, right? The Trinity, eh, prophet, mumpkin, right? <laughs> so, I don't know, that's a good, good question. I do think that um, for someone like me, I have a, I, I can't speak for my colleagues in the room, but I have a relationship with certain philosophers and certain philosophical traditions where I, they are to me, they are guiding to me and they are texts to me and they give my life, uh, they answer certain or help me think about certain kinds of things in a certain way about my life. 
that I'm not saying it's religion, but it, is, it does give my life a certain kind of meaning. So I have a relationship to the history of philosophy and to certain traditions and philosophers that for some people they describe maybe their relationship to a prophet that way. Yes? Yep. Now I say I, I do not I do not nothing. Why I am sure I I'm not sure from my answers, but I'm sure from my questions. Why is my questions is always uh, logical or I I can say it's a good question that I can't find an answer for. I can't find that. I can tell you. So I mean so how do you know what's a good question and a bad question? Yes. Something, something like that. I mean you're right. One of the problems in philosophy is to figure out, like, oh, say, I'm sitting here banging my head against the wall. Am I even asking the right question? And this is back to my partner's question. The, one of the most, maybe the most important thing about philosophy isn't the answer. It's getting the question right. And you're right. A lot of the reason philosophers go crazy is they ask questions that aren't the right questions for them, maybe. Right? So, yeah, I, I mean, getting the right kind of question. And one of the things I said, you have to be patient. When, you're, when you do philosophy, and you have to go slow, and you have to keep working, and you have to be tenacious, right? Because you're gonna ask a lot of wrong questions, or ask a question the wrong way, or try and work on that question in a way that turns up nothing. But that's, again, you know, that's much of life. Uh, I have a quote some here from one of my heroes, Spinoza. Yeah. I have two quotes from him, actually. One of his, which has go back to the public good. I don't know why I didn't read it. The most tyrannical of governments are those which make crimes of opinions. For everyone has an inalienable right to his thoughts. That's cool. That certainly serves the public good. But as to your question, all things excellent are, are, all things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. So yeah, it's hard. It's really important and it's really hard and you're gonna get the questions wrong, but you keep asking them. Yes? Um, I want to be the legal advocate in this group. Just go for it, then you're a philosopher. Okay. Um, I want to start by a uh, quote by the distinguished logician Ted Boudin who said that the state of philosophy nowadays is like the state of mathematics at the time of Rabbi Mondi, which means that philosophy hasn't advanced so much. Um, we know Yep. So we have many trials, ego and his dialect, um, dialect of logic to achieve a philosophical knowledge and many other trials, but no one seems to succeed. Philosophers have not agreed on a sound methodology. Yep. Mathematicians did it the same for science. So maybe someone, not me, but someone could say, why don't philosophers stop asking some traditional philosophical questions like um, if God exists, if there is any reality, and just focus on establishing some methodology. If we don't know the method by which to acquire knowledge, how can we make sure that uh, our answers are right? If we have no method to know what is right and what is wrong, by, by, by right I mean true and false, not uh, good. Okay. If we have no such methodology, how can we check our, our answer? Great. Okay. So what's great for me? Okay, wow, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So you just saved me a whole bunch of work. Right, I mean, in a way, you just gave a perfect example. 
You ask a great question, you make a great point. I mean, why should, look, everything else seems to be making progress. Science is doing great, mathematics is doing great, field medal, woo, right? Wonderful things. And then philosophy gets you nowhere. I just said, I admitted it. I think Socrates is doing as what well, did as well with the question of how should I live my life is certainly better than I'm doing with it, right? And as well as he did was here, I don't know. So yeah, it's frustrating. And everyone else is doing it. So, so then your question is, so we need a method. So what's the, I'm sick of all this, I don't know. So what I'm gonna do is to find the method is I'm gonna go look back at the history of philosophy and figure out if I can find a method to answer the questions and find a method. So I try Hegel's method, nah, mishmumkin. Then I go and I try Heidegger, maybe I'll do some Wittgenstein, maybe it's the language that's screwing every, right? That's, fun. that's what doing philosophy is. Now I am curious about what you think about the difference between theoretical and applied mathematics and theoretical and applied physics, for example, and how they relate to philosophy. Because I think actually philosophy in many ways is like those fields. There are ways that you can say, make philosophy practical, sure. There's a thing called bioethics, right? It's a field of applied philosophy, applied ethics, where we take the tools and we figure out how to solve difficult problems having to do with medicine, right? Questions about what do we owe a patient? When do we stop giving care? Do we need to give informed consent to do something to someone? How do we do that if they're unconscious, right? What is the status of, uh, you know, when is a baby a person? Oh, are all those, those are important things and we do that. So we do have methods where it can be productive. But you're right, at some point philosophy stops appearing to be useful, right? It starts spinning its wheels. Wittgenstein talks about philosophy just going like this. But I think, you know, real theoretical physics, real, you know, far out, not applied mathematics when it gets really theoretical, it's deeply philosophical. And it admits, going in, it knows it's not gonna get a satisfying answer. It's not trying to, right? So you make a great point, and you should never be afraid to call out a philosopher. Say, show me the money. No, really, you tell me this is so valuable and important, show me, that's my problem. So if you spend a semester in the classroom with me, and hopefully a little bit today, I can show you some of the ways that I don't think it's a waste of time. At the end of the day, whose choice is it to decide that? Yours, not mine. Uh, one, way in the back, yeah. Okay, well, I'm gonna be his devil's advocate and say, look, the reason methods are important is because look at what science has been able to do in 2000 years. And it's because it's developed these methods and techniques and all that and mathematics as well. Why can't philosophy do that? And so I think to ask, to say, give me a method, make, show me that philosophy can do something, that there's a method and you're not just asking a bunch of crazy questions, that's okay. I think you're right though, that to say, you're not legitimate. What, the questions you're asking aren't legitimate unless you have a method ready to answer them. But that's not fair either. So I think you're both asking reasonable questions. And again, you're going to hear me say this again. The only way we'd make any headway is to sit down together and do some work. Right? Yes, Robin.
Natasha, can I expand on that a teeny bit? It's the same idea. Instead of thinking of progress the way that, that the mathematician does, there's another scientific model that maps well onto what she's talking about, namely evolution. You might say philosophy evolves, right? So it changes, and there are new things happening and developments going on. But one of the, if anyone who's studied at all evolution, one of the big mistakes is to think that evolution is making progress. It's not. It's not better after an evolutionary step than it was before. It's just different. It's movement, change. Something new is happening, right? There's been a mutation, right? The popular, that does, that's not progress. But it is, you're not staying in the same place either, are you? No. So I think, does that sort of? That's great. Not now, now? All right, I have, it is 8 o'clock. It's 8.30. It's brutal. OK. <laughs> I was getting ready to say I'm going to 15 minutes. I've got to get on a plane. I have so much for that. Yes, please. say, you know, we should each find our own way. But at the same time, philosophy is also not just saying, hey, whatever you think is cool for you. Because philosophy does make demands, right? Because uh, if you say, well, each person has their own, one of the things the philosopher says, okay, that's fine. Now, why do you think what you think? Give me your reason. Good. Look at me. I'm awesome. Right? No. And, and 
And since then, that same sense of resistance, of individualism, of autonomy, trying to right, be self-determining. And that's as, that's as necessary now as it's ever been, maybe more necessary now. Yeah. It's more necessary now. Excellent. Yeah, but the tyranny, yeah, but the tyranny, there's always been the majority and there's always been the opinion of the group in power. Whether that's on the internet or whether it's in a village in the middle of sub-Saharan Africa 2,000 years ago. There's always been the what you should think. And philosophy has always resisted that. And now the way it's resisting that is very different in one sense, but it's the same resistance.